Amen. So today we begin our season of Advent, and all Advent really means is us looking forward to the coming of Christ. It actually means coming or arrival. And so in this season, I don't know about y'all, but over the next uh, month or so, I'm going to go to more parties I'm going to give and receive more gifts and consume more calories than I will at any other time uh, for the whole year. Uh, it gets really, really, really busy. And you add like the commercialization uh, where everything has to be perfect. Your party has to be perfect. Your gift has to be perfect. The, you know, the, the, the spread of food, that you, everything has to be perfect, right, for everyone. Uh, it's really easy for us as believers in Christ to forget about the reason why we would take the time to celebrate. And so through this season of Advent, I'm going to do my best to remind you uh, exactly why we bother, why we celebrate the, the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, you all, we have reason to celebrate uh, because the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he took on flesh, he stepped down out of heaven, um, and he revealed himself to us through the person of Jesus Christ who ultimately went to the cross that we might live. Uh, if you're not a member of our church, what you may not know about us is that uh, in this room today, throughout our members, uh, there are people who um, are liars and, and thieves and adulterers and addicts. I mean, if you could just run through the list of sins that the members of this body are guilty of, uh, it, it might make you red-faced a bit. And yet the reason that we celebrate is because our great God stepped down out of heaven in the person of Jesus Christ. And he ultimately lived a perfect life here. And he went to the cross to bear our sins, that we don't hang our heads in shame anymore because of our former life and sin. But today, we celebrate the work of Jesus Christ as victors because of the cross that Jesus endured on our behalf. And so, y'all, we have a lot to celebrate today. We have a lot to celebrate in this season. It would, it would be tragic if we got focused on the gifts and the kind of the commercialized holiday that has become Christmas. We need to celebrate the fact that God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Today, I want to um, just spend a little bit of time uh, encouraging you from the Word, and then we're going to have a time of shared communion together, uh, just remembering the benefits uh, of the work of Jesus Christ for us through communion. But I want to begin today in 1 John chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. Uh, if you're not super familiar with the Bible, I want to catch you up just a little bit. Uh, John was one of the men who was uh, one of Jesus' closest associates. Uh, he knew him intimately. And he also understood kind of the, the Jewishness that had come leading up to Christ, which meant that uh, early on God chose a people for him, himself. They were the nation of, of Israel. Uh, he said, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. Basically, the nation of Israel is going to represent God to the world. And so they did pretty well. God gave them a law, like keep my law. It's going to set you apart from all the people. And they're going to recognize that your God is indeed good and he blesses you. And yet uh, the people didn't obey the law. And they often rebelled against God. And rather than heeding when the prophets would come and point them back to God, they continued to go their own way. Now, when John uh, begins writing his gospel, this is when we transfer from B.C. to A.D., uh, Jesus has come. He's already uh, been to the cross. John is going to write his gospel. It's the good news of what Jesus Christ came to do. And that nation of Israel who had sinned against God and turned away from him, God sends his son, Jesus Christ, to make an atoning sacrifice for their sins. And so John's going to open here today, not necessarily in the first century where John live, but he's going to take us back to the very beginning, and he's going to teach us about Jesus, all right? Now, John is going to refer to Jesus as the Word, um, and in the Greek, that is the word logos, and it means much of what it means for us. The word, word, I know this is challenging, stay with me. The word, word, uh, is what we use to describe something, and so if, if there is a dog there, we would call it a dog, and everyone would know what we were talking about, right? Uh, the, the logos in Greek is very similar. It is the expression of a thing. It's how we would describe it. It's how we would know what that thing is, and so Jesus is God revealed to mankind. 
Um, we, we haven't seen God. You know, like we don't get to you know, uh, walk and talk with him as Adam and Eve did in the garden. We don't get to you know, hear him audibly with our voice. But Jesus is God revealed. He's God in the flesh. And John wants us to be really clear in understanding exactly who Jesus is. And so he begins in John chapter 1, verse 1. Just to lay this out, you would know that he's not just a man who came one time, but he was God. He says this, in the beginning was the word. Before all that you and I know and see was created, the Word was. Jesus isn't a later creation. He wasn't like a a good idea God had because man had sinned and the world went awry. Jesus was with God in the beginning. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. Uh, What he's uh, referencing here is the concept of the Trinity. Now, we do not see the third person of the Trinity in the person of the Holy Spirit in this text, but we see God the Father and God the Son here in this text. We'll go into the Trinity later. I don't have that much time this morning, but just uh, suffice to say, uh, God exists in three persons of one unified being, okay? And he was with God in the beginning. Now, here is what Jesus did. If you want to know who God is, if you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus. And so maybe you're here today, and as you think about God, you think he's like some angry father who's always disappointed at you. Or maybe you think God is distant and he's uncaring. Or or maybe you think God is, is something other altogether. Listen, you can know who God is by looking at the person of Jesus Christ. You can look at how he lived. You can look at how he loved, how he acted among people. And you will know what God is like. Jesus is the word. He is God expressed. He is God reveal. Here in verse 3, it says, all things came into being through him. Jesus was the agent of creation. He's the one who created all things. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. If, if you know much of your Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth and, you know, the oceans and the stars and all that we know and see. And he created uh, Adam and Eve, the man and woman, and he said it is good. All that God created was good. It reflected his nature and his character. It was good. But if you know the story of the Bible, you know that Adam and Eve chose to sin. And when sin entered into God's perfect creation, things went awry very, very quickly. Whereas Jesus was light and life, sin brought darkness that separated us from God. And you read much of the story of the Old Testament, and it is littered with hurt and with pain and with death and suffering and darkness. I mean, if you've lived very long in this world, you are probably well acquainted with the pain that comes as a, as a result of living in this fallen and broken world that's fallen and broken as a result of sin. And so some of you, you're ready to celebrate Christmas and you're, you're extremely excited about what, what we get to do and, and celebrating on behalf of family and the coming of Jesus. And some of you, when you think about the holiday season, your heart's just filled with pain. Maybe that's because Christmas has never been a happy time for you. Maybe Christmas is a season where your family fights, or your parent left, or you lost a loved one. That darkness and that pain, that suffering that we feel is the result of sin. God created everything perfect. There was no suffering or hurting or pain or death. But when sin entered in, darkness came with it. And John tells us something about what happens to us as a result of living in that darkness. Because Adam and Eve sinned, we too were born into sin. In verse 5, he says, And the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not grasp it. Now, your translation may say understand or comprehend or even overcome. Uh, I believe the best translation is actually comprehend. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness could not comprehend it. Because of sin in our life, we were made spiritually dead. We couldn't see the light anymore. We didn't know the way or the truth or the life. We didn't know how to live in this world. We didn't know right from wrong. Like We didn't have all of that because we were in the darkness. And though the light shone in the darkness, we did not understand it, those of us who were in darkness. Now, if you'll jump down to verse 14... Here's the good news. 
Here's where God begins to intervene on our behalf. The reason that we would celebrate. It says in verse 14, And the Word became flesh. The Word who was in the beginning, who was God, who was with God. The Word who brings light and life, who expresses God to the world. The Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. And we saw His glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, you have seen the glory of God. You have seen his goodness. You've known his kindness. You have known his grace. Um, when, when I was younger, um, when I'm, I'm coming up in this life before God revealed himself to me, before I came to faith in Jesus, uh, I may have been just like you. I tried to make my own way. I had my own understandings of how the world should function of how people should live, and generally it meant that everyone should, should make my life better, right? That was everyone else's job was to enrich my life. Life was ultimately about me. Uh, but as Jesus Christ has saved me and began to transform my life, as I've seen the glory of God, I've seen that there is a, a new way. I've come to know the truth, and I've come to understand what life really is. Now, I'm going to be honest. I'm a pastor. I don't always walk in that, and I, I fail oftentimes uh, I still give in to my sinful tendency sometimes, but I've had the opportunity. I've had the joy. I've had the pleasure of knowing the glory of God, of walking and living the abundant life that God intended for every single one of us to live. Have you all ever tried to wander around in a dark room? This morning when I came into this building, and I, I work here throughout the week. I'm, I've grown up in this church, uh, but the windows are, are blacked out and the lights wouldn't work. And, and that doesn't ever go very well, right? And so it's completely dark in here, and I'm trying to uh, feel my way through the room. And though I know there are chairs out there, I'm just not very sure where they are. And I'm trying to feel, but the chairs are, are down here, and I'm trying to make my way through the darkness. And you know what happens? Somebody's going to get hurt. And we see it all across our world today. But the Word, the one who is life and light, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, John, this is talking about John the Baptist who came, he was in the wilderness, he was declaring, prepare the way for the Lord. John testified about Jesus and called out saying, this is he of whom I said, he who is coming after me has proved to be my superior because he, is, he existed before me. He was in the beginning. He created all we know and see. He's greater than I am. For of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Now, the law of Moses is a standard by which um, we would live our lives. If you've read much of the Old Testament, the Torah, you get a little Leviticus, Deuteronomy, you know about the law of Moses. They're, they're, you, know, you can eat certain foods, you can only wear certain fabrics, and only then certain blends. You don't want to get off track there. Uh, there, there were all sorts of, of laws that govern life. And every one of those laws God had given for a specific purpose. If you've ever tried to live up or even just try to be a good person, you've had a similar recognition. Those laws were given to make the Israelites, the nation of Israel, the world, conscious that they needed a Savior. If you've ever tried to be good and to do all the right things and to be that faithful husband or wife or friend or that really good parent, it's probably served to help you realize that you can't do it, that you often fall short, that you fail, and that what would be true of the nation of Israel is also true of us, that we need a Savior. We sin. We hurt people. We get really fixed on ourselves. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Here's what Jesus did for us. Jesus came to this earth, and he lived a perfect, sinless life. He didn't sin even one time. He was falsely accused, and he was arrested. And he was beaten. And he was crucified. His blood was shed. And he did that as a sacrifice for us. What Jesus Christ did on the cross was he endured the punishment that you and I deserved. That rather than receiving the just penalty for our sin, which is death, 
we instead got to receive life. You see, if you want to know what God is like, you look at the person of Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8 tells us this. If you want to know what God is like, here, here's who God, what God is like. God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. I don't know what your sin is, and I don't know what your story looks like. I don't know where you've been or what you've done, but here's what I want you to know. Jesus Christ looked at you. God looked at you and loved you so much that he offered his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, that Jesus would endure the agony of the cross, the beating, the humiliation. He would do that so that you might find new life in him. And so for us who are wandering in the darkness, Jesus went to the cross that we might be reunited with the Father, that we could know the way and the truth and the life again. John tells us that in verse 18. He says, no one has seen God at any time. We haven't seen him with our eyes or heard him with our ears. God, the only son who is in the arms of the Father, he has explained him. Remember what John said about the darkness? It couldn't comprehend the light. Jesus Christ, the Word, God revealed, God expressed. He came to explain God to us. And the message of Jesus Christ is known as the gospel or the good news because Jesus Christ came to die that we might find true life in him. Y'all, we have reason to celebrate. Y'all, I've blown it in more ways than I could count. Man, I, I've done the things that I swore that I would never do. If my life were the, the, kind of the sum of my best efforts, I would not have gotten very far. But Jesus Christ went to the cross for me to explain God, that we might know his glory, that we might walk with him, that we might have a relationship with him, that we might live the life that God intended for us to live. God didn't intend for you to live in your addiction. And God didn't intend for you to live in the brokenness and the, the abuse and the pain and the, the suffering of this world. God intended for you to live the abundant life. And we can walk and we can live that. We're freed from the grip of darkness and of sin and death and addiction and all the things. We are freed because the Word became flesh and He made His dwelling among us. And as Jesus came and He walked this earth, He was explaining God to us. God's not a distant and uncaring Father. He offered His own Son that we might have life. He's not disappointed in you. He's not ashamed of you. God loved enough to die for you that you might walk in new life. So my challenge for you today is in this Christmas season, don't lose sight of the reason that we celebrate. And don't lose sight of the reason that we rejoice and we sing Christmas carols and do strange things that we otherwise would never do in our culture, right? We do it because we're celebrating a Savior who died that we might have life. The coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we celebrate his season of his first coming. And through Advent, we're ultimately going to celebrate looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ, where the world will be redeemed fully. So today, what I want to do as we begin this season of Advent is I want us to take communion together. I want us to remember the blood that was shed on our behalf. Um, in communion, we, we drink a little bit of juice, and there's a, a little wafer on the top of the cup there. And Jesus did this in the, in the Last Supper. He brought his disciples together, and he said, um, drink this, this cup, the, the wine in this cup. This is the blood of a new covenant. That no longer are we under the law that we live on the base of what we, we do or don't do, but now we live under the grace of Jesus Christ. So Jesus' blood was shed on our behalf. It was offered up for us that we could be reunited with God. But he also took the bread and he said, This is my body, which is for you, that we would receive in ourselves the person and the work of Jesus Christ that we would understand that we're not what we once were, that we've been made new, that we've been reborn as believers in Jesus Christ and that God himself now dwells within us. And while we couldn't be the parent we wanted to be, we couldn't be the kind of spouse we want to be, we couldn't live the abundant life on our own, we, through the, 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 the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the body that was offered up for us, we can live the abundant life that Jesus came to purchase for us. So today, um, we're going to receive communion in just a minute. The deacons are going to be down here. I'm going to pray. Um, we're going to have people in the front and people in the back, wherever you want to go and receive this. Uh, and here's how it works in our church. 
If you are a member of the body of Jesus Christ, not necessarily a member of this church, but if you have come to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're a disciple of Jesus, we invite you to receive communion with us. We're remembering the work of Jesus. We can celebrate that together as believers. Now, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've never come to faith in him, uh, then this is not for you. This is just something we would ask that you would kind of sit and watch. And this is something that we celebrate as men and women who've come to faith in Christ. We pray that you would do the same at some point. And so just want to be clear about how communion works for us. I want to pray over us. If you don't know uh, about the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you've seen today that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that we might move from darkness to light, that we might might see the way, the truth, and life, and have hope in Him. I would love to visit with you that, about that later. But for now, we're going to have a time of communion, so I'm going to invite you to bow with me. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. You are the Word who was in the beginning, and you are the Word who became flesh. And God, we see the cross that speaks of your love for us, that you would suffer and die there, that we might have true life God, that we wouldn't have to pay the just penalty for our sins. God, you did that for us, that we might be reunited with God and that we might live forever with you, that eternal and abundant life. Father, I pray that we wouldn't settle for the empty and the broken things of this world. God, that we would live in the riches that have been afforded to us by the cross of Jesus Christ. And we pray it in his name. Amen.